This is uh, Jim Manker with CSAC Finance Corporation, and we just are really thankful to have you with us today to talk about this important uh, topic with CalAIM and the county impacts. Uh, this is uh, one of many webinars that we have been uh, doing throughout this uh, year of shutdown and virtuality. And uh, we're excited for our uh, panel. They're going to be introduced here in a, in a few minutes but just wanted to give you uh, a couple of Id items to think about. Number one, we will be recording, as I said, this webinar, and we will make that available to you uh, after the uh, webinar is concluded. We also will send out the slide deck that you'll see this morning as well. And there will be some time for question and answers uh, at the end of this uh, presentation. As usual, you can use the Q&A or, or the chat feature um, to ask questions. And uh, again, we'll have time to do that at the end of this seminar or webinar, excuse me. Um, happy to partner with uh, HealthNet and Centene. Centene has been, uh, and HealthNet have been a partner of the CSAC Finance Corporation, CSAC in general, for as long as I've been doing this job, and that's at least eight years. Um, so we're just really thankful for their expertise. We're thankful for their partnership and uh, we're really looking forward to today's uh, topic. Um, and without further ado, I wanna turn it over to uh, the health poly policy manager for HealthNet, uh, our partner, Sydney Turner. So Sydney, why don't you take it now and why don't you uh, share with us a little more about the panelists or have them do that themselves, thank you. Thank you, Jim, um, and thank you for, for this opportunity to um, present to you all. I'm actually going to punt to Dr. Tudor to introduce us. So Dr. Tudor, would you like to take it away, ma'am? Absolutely. Thank you so much, and good morning, everyone. So my name is Jennifer Tudor. I serve as the Deputy Chief Medical Officer for the County of San Diego, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. And really, this is from the perspective of the whole County of San Diego. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. The objective, um, oops, one more. The objectives today are to really share with you how we as the county work in a geographic managed care um, where we have seven managed care health plans and one behavioral health or SMI plan. We realize we're only one of two of the um, GMC counties, but the way we do things is through the lens of both Healthy San Diego, which is our organization of all managed care Medi-Cal plans, as well as through the um, mission and passion of San Diego County, which is Live Well San Diego. And so really this, this perspective is bringing together how we as the county were able to, um, through the 1115 waivers, fund whole person care, how that transition or addition of health homes program as a benefit of our seven health plans came to be. And then as we're planning the transition to Cal AIM, where things happen in instead of the counties being funded for this service, then the managed care plans be, uh, are funded for the service and how we can continue that goal for the plans instead of the county now to drive that investment in our necessary delivery, um, delivery system infrastructure. So we have today um, amazing Amaris Sanchez, who has coordinated the program Thank you. Coordinated the program for whole person care in San Diego. We call it whole person wellness um, with our two key partners who have been doing the on the ground work, Path and Exodus, and um, some really amazing results with collaboration with our plans through Healthy San Diego, where we have not to steal George's thunder, but um, all kinds of meetings, including care conferences, which having worked at, at health plans, I've only seen that in individual health plans, not in bringing together seven health plans together. It's just phenomenal. Then um, George Scolari is gonna talk a little more about the, the system and the, um, and the collaboration between Healthy San Diego. And George, even though he is employed by Community Health Group, one of, another one of our plans, he will always say, and you'll always hear any of our Healthy San Diego members say, um, I am so-and-so and I am here on behalf of Healthy San Diego. And so that's been a 20 year 
process and evolution, but it's really, really important because um, that is um, how we serve our uh, community-based organizations and how we serve most importantly, our clients, our members, our beneficiaries, our patients, whoever, whatever name you wanna attach to that is they don't really care who we're with with what, they care that they're getting the services and whoever's helping them understands them and is not duplicating or replicating um, services or even questions. Then we'll go to Kitty Bailey, who's the executive director of Neighborhood Networks um, and who reminded me that everyone was on um, in the very beginning. So you'll see that really important public-private partnerships there um, as I applied my chapstick. And um, so Kitty is gonna talk about one experience um, with the Health Homes Program, um, working with um, enhanced care management and serving as a, a hub for other community organizations. And then some lessons we can learn from that going to Cal AIM. And then we will end with Sydney, um, giving the big picture of Cal AIM now that we have learned how San Diego has worked both with Whole Person Wellness and with Health Homes Program and how we're planning to move that um, all into Cal AIM, seamless transition, and again, keeping um, patients and families in, in the center. So um, the next slide is my last slide, and that is just giving you an idea of what our vision for the past 10 years has been for San Diego. Just like the old adage, once you've seen one FQHC, you've seen one FQHC. Well, really, once you've seen one county, you have seen one county in California. and. Um, so the way that we work is through Live Well, and we're making sure that everything we do is aligned with building better health, living safely, and thriving. That has been our lens of equity for 10 years, and so we have Live Well partners and community partners. And in fact, that's how we've even worked our whole outreach and education for COVID, is working with each of those partners, whether they're healthcare or schools, or government entities with our 18 different um, cities here, um, tribal nations and so forth. So all that we are presenting is through this lens um, with our shared common mission in San Diego of building better health, living safely and thriving. So with that, I am going to turn the slides over. I think we actually have George first talking about the framework with Healthy San Diego. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tudor. So again, I'm George Clary. I represent Healthy San Diego, and I'm going to go over what our collaborative is, how it got started, and how it led into our wonderful whole person wellness program in San Diego. So Healthy San Diego is a, a unique collaborative that started in 19, in 1998, years before that, actually. The state of California started moving more and more Medi-Cal beneficiaries into Medi-Cal managed care. And the difference that happened in July of 1998 was a certain population of Medi-Cal beneficiaries were required to enroll in a Medi-Cal managed care plan. And due to this, we formed the Healthy San Diego Collaborative, which is a very unique partnership um, in big time with our county's Health and Human Service Agency, but also with um, the school systems and providers, federally qualified health centers, behavioral health providers, all other specialists, hospital partners are there um, and have been from day one. So our, our system is different than some systems in California. And forgive me if I'm saying things that you guys already know, which you, you likely do, but the, the models in California are different. There's primarily four models. There's actually six, but there's four key models. Um, we are what's called geographic managed care. And we are one of two counties, which is San Diego and Sacramento. And it was San Diego County in 94 or five that actually wrote legislation that created the geographic managed care model. And what we wanted in San Diego under the leadership of one of our lead advocates, Greg Nall, and our, um, our health and human service agency director at the time, Dr. Robert Ross, was to have a choice. We didn't want Medi-Cal beneficiaries to have to enroll in a managed care, one single managed care system. We wanted them to have a choice. And there were seven health plans that came to the table and Healthy San Diego was formed with our, with our county partners. So we are what's called geographic managed care. We have sort of like a board of directors that we call our Healthy San Diego Joint Consumer and Professional Advisory Committee. That is two different committees that after meeting for a few months early on decided they could be just one committee. So we just call them the joint committee. And um, most of us on representing San Diego are on that committee. 
representing our own agencies, like Dr. Tudor represents Health and Human Service Agency, I represent my plan, Sydney represents hers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And underneath that, we have two major primary subcommittees. One is our quality improvement subcommittee and the other is our behavioral health subcommittee. Behavioral health is something I formed and shared um, since 1998. So we started very early on because mental health services was removed as a Medi-Cal benefit back in July 1998 when we started. And the counties had the form was called a mental health plan. So every county in California has their own mental health plan that serves Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So we have our behavioral health work group, our subcommittee. And underneath that, we have um, other work groups or ad hoc groups, several of them actually, not all of them are listed on the document that's on the back side. Um, but between the two, the subcommittee of the quality improvement and the behavioral health, we've got up to 13 subgroups that meet. Under behavioral health, which is about 160 people strong, we also formed our CalAIM work group. And the reason we chose behavioral health is behavioral health already had all of the county behavioral health providers and their contractor providers and hospitals and homeless providers. Almost everybody we, besides all the health plans and the health plan um, medical providers, that really seemed like the right place to put CalAIM because CalAIM encompasses everything to do with Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So we formed a couple years ago, a few years ago, the CalAIM work group. That too is about 150 people strong and there's multiple work groups underneath that group. So that's the basic structure of Healthy San Diego and how we work. Um, a few years ago, our San Diego County um, um, Director of Integrative Services at the time or Deputy Director Susan Bauer approached us wanting to know if we would like to get involved in a new grant type of program they were um, applying for called Whole Person Care. And so the seven health plans got together and we talked about it and we didn't know much about it, but we, we all said yes immediately because we'd like to be a good partner with our county. And we are, we're, we've been, we have a long um, relationship working with each other going back to the early nineties. So all the health plans got on board and learned about what um, the whole person care program was gonna be. And in San Diego, they had decided they're gonna call it the whole person wellness program. And we chose to kind of set up a model very similar to Healthy San Diego. So for whole person wellness, we have a, a management team that has a lot of people on it. And we have a clinical review team, which exists to this day and, and is key and is gonna be key when Amaris talks a little bit more about whole person wellness in San Diego, but how we transition the whole person wellness members to enhanced care management that we're gonna be speaking about is all gonna happen under that clinical review team, which is led by a, a, an MD, Dr. Michael Prelstein, who's the clinical director of County Behavioral Services and Lily Wang, um, a utilization management manager with one of our Medi-Cal managed care plans in San Diego. So we've got four different doctors that always participate on the clinical review team. And as we make um, the move to transition them come January 1st to enhanced care management under CalAIM, which we will get into details a little bit later, we've got MDs and a lot of clinical people really looking at every single person to make sure we don't have one fall through any cracks. And with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Amaris unless um, I guess we can hold off for questions later on. So Amaris, all yours. And thank you for giving me some time on the agenda, everybody. Hi there. Uh, my name is Amaris Sanchez with uh, Health and Human Services. I am hoping that my computer doesn't go out. Sometimes my uh, my speaker does not like Zoom meetings for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. Um, could we ad advance the slides a bit? Thanks. Um, so I, so as I said, I'm Amherst Sanchez with Health and Human Services. I work in a uh, division called Integrative Services. Um, and so we're a little bit different. If we could get, jump to the next slide. Um, so Integrative Services was initially um, kind of put together as a, a smaller division to help within Health and Human Services break up some of those silos that happen, some of them based on um, just the fact that everyone's really busy, but some of them based on uh, kind of how, um, you know, how funding structures work. 
Um, so initially, uh, we were working to do a lot of um, kind of consulting and technical assistance to work through communication and project planning. Um, but then we were tapped to take on the whole person care pilot, which as Dr. Tudor mentioned, we call locally whole person wellness. You can advance to the next one. Um, and so uh, as George said, there is a, a real long history of integration and relationship between health and human services and our seven managed care plans. And as he mentioned, you know, uh, seeing whole person care through the vision of Susan Bauer, some of you who may know, was with Health and Human Services for many years, um, and kind of jumping off a, a local project called Project 25, which was a, a real partnership between the United Way, the county, the managed care plans, and a service provider called uh, Father Joe's Villages, and looking at how investments in permanent supportive housing reduce the use of uh, public services for folks who are normally high utilizers of things like ambulances and emergency departments and taking that um, taking those folks giving them really intensive deep services and helping them to maintain those housing and then being able to show really significant gains over a period of time as far as a reduction in um, the money that's going out for public services they showed, they partnered up with uh, Point Loma Nazarene University for um, a real deep study on this and showed about a 90% decrease in the amount of uh, public services being used. So to be able to kind of jump off of that, take that, take all of that data learning and um, be able to take the structure that DHCS had put out within the whole person care application and look at what we knew locally was working and kind of make that more available within the community for a much larger um, population of folks than, than what had been served in Project 25. So some of the things that, um, that needed to happen for that was of course a really intensive MOA uh, process. A lot of you probably on the phone know that that is not easy, especially when we had seven plans. We had the county. Um, we also internal to the county have behavioral health, um, you know, which has has its own, um, you know, privacy and data considerations, as well as a partnership with our sheriff's department, who for sure have their own data and privacy considerations. And so being really able to, uh, to leverage those relationships that were born out of the healthy San Diego um, space to, to you know, push this through and get everybody to, to the same table and really be able to determine what do we want to measure? What do we want to look at? And, and what kind of data um, really is that? Um, so, we kind of looked at, you know, what is the minimum necessary information for us to, as a county and as a collaborative, respond to um, the reporting and metrics that the whole person care pilots um, were responsible for, and then being able to create um, a lot of structure. Uh, for, for example, we created a, a data group that consisted of all the data folks between uh, the county departments, our public safety group, health and human services, medical care services, and then all of our plans uh, coming together at the same table to kind of make that, that structure uh, work and, and make it operational um, to the point where, you know, now we actually don't need a data work group because everybody is in agreement and knows, you know, what's going on. So next slide, please. So just an overview of our pilot, um, we are one of uh, a very few counties that ended up contracting out our services. Um, and But we wanted to make sure that uh, we had full coverage across our different county regions and looking at it as really filling a gap between the homeless system and the mainstream medical services. 
Um, you know, for those of you that are familiar with HUD funding and entitlement funding um, through HUD and the continuum of care funding, um, you know, we have permanent supportive housing for populations such as whole person care, and then we have outreach funding, but there isn't really a, a supportive services kind of bridge um, space uh, where folks have the capacity to do ongoing, sometimes a week, two weeks, sometimes uh, three month long uh, engagement um, with individuals and then to be able to spend the time that is needed to get folks really engaged and invested in the services. A lot of uh, traditional case management programs and even some traditional uh, outreach programs just don't have the bandwidth um, for that. So we, we really um, took the pilot identified in Project 25 and broadened it a bit to be individuals for homeless, at risk of homelessness, with a behavioral health substance use disorder and or chronic physical health condition. A lot of our folks have, have all three. Um, and, uh, and that's okay, that's, that's what we do. Um, so our project really leaned into creating those connections and fostering them and maintaining them between managed care, traditional social services, our hospital system, our law enforcement partners, specifically locally, our sheriff's department, uh, HMIS and our COC and other county services, and really began building this care coordination model that now is a model and, and being used in a couple of smaller spin-offs for other similar type populations. Next slide, please. So just a quick shout out to our amazing contractors that Dr. Tudor mentioned, Path and Exodus, really give it their all and we couldn't do it without them. Next slide. So just a couple of uh, key program features, our clinical review team, or we call it CRT, uh, I think, you know, in the framework of, of thinking about what has worked really well for, for not only the folks that we serve, but also the, the direct service staff who are out there and trying to navigate all of these systems, um, who, you know, for some of whom are also new as well. Um, you know, we have a lot of folks uh, graduating, you know, coming out of our, um, our social work programs that don't really know how to navigate managed care. Um, and so really without this, this being another piece of the structure, that, you know, the main structure of our program, um, it, it would be really hard, I think, to, to have achieve, achieved some of the successes that we have because managed care has its own language. Um, and there's, you know, we didn't, the whole person care application didn't come with a, uh, you know, a, a guidebook <laughs> on, on what that is. Um, so it's really, really key, I think, um, for... Looks like she's frozen. Who'd like to take over? Let's, um, while, while we're getting her back, let's um, go to the next slide, please. So, and this is this is George and I, I co-chair with AMRES, the whole prison wellness management team and never miss the clinical review team because it's very interesting and, and the, the collaboration is incredible. So housing accomplishments, 90% um, have received permanent housing retention rate at six months, an increase of 58% over the prior year of annual reporting, 80% retention rate at 12 months, 65% of those ever enrolled have been housed, which is unbelievable, and 55% of enrollees have been permanently housed. Next slide, please. So housing is healthcare, 18% decrease in number of emergency department visits, for those permanently housed, 29% um, um, decrease. And you know, that really goes back to the, the Medi-Cal Managed Care Plans, you know, being willing to be a partner in this program because the county is doing all this stuff for our members and you know, 
keeping us from paying for unnecessary emergency departments is just unbelievable work. 38% decrease in number of days spent in a psych hospital and inpatient units for those permanently housed. That was primarily based on our one and only San Diego County Psychiatric Hospital, which is where people are often taken in by police and other law enforcement officers when they're having um, psychiatric emergencies. And 6% decrease in days spent in the hospital for those permanently housed, 57% uh, decrease. Next slide. And I don't know, Amaris, did you, were you able to get back on? I am, but it sounds oh, okay. like you did a great job. All right, good deal. <laughs> Teamwork, see, see, this yes. just proves how collaborative we are. <laughs> it is, and, and of course, I'm gonna say, can you go back to the slide where Amaris dropped off? Because there was one thing, George, that I think is really cool that the clinical right. um, leadership committee developed. If you can go back one more slide and maybe, there we go. Amaris, can you talk a little bit, the section in green below, about um, just for a sec, we didn't mention the service integration teams or the SIT teams and then how we came to identify the need for a high acuity team midway through the program. Sure, yeah, so sorry about that. Like I said, my computer does not like Zoom sometimes. Um, so yeah, our model is that we call them SITs and HATs. Um, so the service integration teams have a one to 25 case ratio um that's mandatory and monitored uh and those are made up of four folks housing navigator clinician a case manager and a peer support specialist um and then so you know we have uh had developed it with these certain phases that folks would kind of move through um throughout the their their kind of time in the program which you know we're estimating would be about two years or so um, but we were kind of finding after about a, a year of being in business that there were folks, you know, for whom um, their, you know, their medical issues, their service issues were so intense that um, they, they were kind of skewing um, the, the team's ab ability to, to spend time with other folks. Um, so we went back to, to DHCS and we kind of uh, combined two of the phases to make this high acuity team option, which has a one to 10 ratio. Um, so these are folks for whom the teams are spending sometimes four full days a week with um, because the needs are just so great. Um, and so this is what has really worked well for us. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I know we had reported out to DHCS recently that um, our high acuity teams, I think on average, were spending about 33 hours a week um, with folks within their first 60 days of enrollment. So you can imagine uh, that that's a, a, lot, a lot of time and um, you know, would not really have been possible within a kind of traditional case management model, you know, relying on one person um, to, to provide services and advocacy for a, another individual. Um, and I think we, you know, it, it has just been a real key to, to some of our success. Thank you so much. So now we can advance slides and Kitty, I believe you are next. Great, thank you. Um, so we're changing gears a little bit. We're um, switching from the whole person care program to the health homes program, which um, I'm sure many of you are aware of will also be transitioned into enhanced care management in 2022. And so what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today is a unique solution that we developed here in San Diego to address the health homes program population with um, some of our really strong social service agencies here in San Diego to really enhance their ability to take health home program contracts and serve these clients in really kind of grassroots neighborhood-based ways. 
So um, I am the executive director of Neighborhood Networks. I go by Kitty, um, but I am Catherine Bailey. Um, and Network Neighborhood Networks is an innovative intermediary service that we design to address health-related social needs and coordinate care social service agencies that can um, that hire our neighborhood navigators, which in health homes parlance is called care coordinators. And um, you can think of the health homes population as a couple steps down from the whole person care population. So, um, and I have a, a sort of sample person here we're gonna talk about, we'll give you a flavor of the kind of client we're dealing with. Um, so this is uh, something a little bit about our, the clients we serve and the approach we take. This is a template of a client, a sample client, Eduardo. And we look at uh, Eduardo comprehensively as um, all health homes program participants and um, CBCMEs, which are community-based care management entities would do. We look at the social domain, the medical domain, behavioral health and safety. And so you can see here, the variety of factors that a client in the health homes program might be facing. Um, this again is a little bit different in that these clients come to us directly from the health plans. They don't run through the county, but uh, Eduardo might be um, employed part-time, monolingual, really struggling with food insecurity, lacking transportation, meeting the definition of home risk, risk of homelessness or homelessness based on his current living situation, definitely suffering from the impacts of poor nutrition, which we could see directly are impacting his medical conditions, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and going into the ER. Uh, he's also been feeling sad and depressed and has a gun in the home. So for those of you that don't know, Eduardo would qualify for health homes and likely qualify in the future for enhanced care management based on both his medical diagnoses and his um, ER utilization. Next slide, please. So when we think about the way the systems, plural, look at Eduardo today, a medical home, wherever Eduardo goes to get his primary care, perhaps a community clinic, perhaps a physician in his neighborhood that takes Medi-Cal, uh, that primary care provider sees somebody who is frequently missing appointments, the chronic conditions he experiences are difficult to control. He's considered non-compliant and a difficult patient, and he might be impacting that physician's office quality scores and maybe some of the P for P payments they get, which of course they don't like. The next slide talks about a different perspective and this would be the health plan's perspective. The health plan would see that Eduardo would be negatively impacting the HEDA scores of the health plan um, due to his care gaps. He's high risk for avoidable hospitalizations. He's likely a high cost member and he might be eligible for some type of case management program. Next slide. Through Health Homes Program and all the way we do our work, we're able to look at Eduardo um, through a whole person approach and have one community-based central source of referrals and support. So you can see the kinds of things and actions that we take as a Health Homes um, provider in this list of things that we would do. We would connect Eduardo back with his PCP, support him in his asthma action plan, uh, educate him on how to properly use um, home control devices for managing his chronic conditions, connect him with food resources, connect him with community-based mental health resources to support him, arrange transportation, work with him on his housing situation, and also educate him regarding that gun safety. So this is the approach we take, and we just wanted to make sure everybody on this call understood that this is really what the Health Homes Program is all about. And if we go to the next slide, so the way we're able to do this in San Diego and leverage some of our really strong social service agencies here is we've brought together three interlinked components into what we call the Neighborhood Networks Hub. And together, we're able to create a comprehensive solution that addresses both clinical needs and social terms of health. And that is a neighborhood navigator care coordinator who are highly trained and culturally competent the community-based organizations that hire those neighborhood navigators who are trusted by the community. And as I said, pretty long-standing um, and rather large and sophisticated social service agencies. And then the neighborhood networks, which acts as a centralized hub and manages or blends and braids contracts because we do have those seven health plans here in San Diego. 
Next slide. This is a little bit of a different perspective of how this all fits together. So you can see on the right, we have the health plans that are the ones sending us their list of members who qualify for health homes. Those lists come into the hub in the middle. We then handle contracting, reimbursements, referrals, data sharing, training, quality improvement. We actually do also do outreach and enrollment at the hub. And then as members are enrolled, we send them over to the community-based organizations who hire and employ the neighborhood navigators in the community, in those neighborhoods. Next slide. As a part of our solution as being the hub entity that is to ensure that these social service agencies can successfully meet the requirements of having a health plan contract, this is the kind of list of things we actually we actively work on as the hub, as this intermediary. It's from contract management to fiscal management, data management, case management administration. We manage a claim system to, so we can do medical billing. Um, we work together with our community information exchange here in San Diego. We utilize a community health worker framework that we've adopted. Uh, we do the workforce training. We assure that home visiting happens successfully. We do on ongoing quality assurance. Uh, we come with a lens of cultural and community humility. Uh, we train everybody on trauma-informed best practices, and we really look at how to be collaborative across all the systems that impact our clients. Next slide. Uh, our, so I was asked to talk a little bit about our experience as a health homes um, provider, which in, is called a community-based care management entity. And we hold four health homes contracts. So we are, the Neighborhood Networks Hub is considered a CBCME. We do subcontract those out to community-based organizations. We have three community-based organizations serving a large swath of San Diego County. One is housed at a school and it's a family resource center and two are social service agencies. Next slide, please. Um, we've experienced obviously a lot of challenges in taking on this work of it's kind of innovative and a new idea. Um, we had to invest a lot of dollars in meeting the privacy and security requirements for health plans. Um, enrolling Medi-Cal clients in a new program is always a challenge. I think we hear this across the board, across the state with health homes um, providers. We're essentially cold calling these Medi-Cal members, asking them if they'd like to enroll in health homes. Uh, we are required to submit extensive data reports in the um, TEL file, which is a targeted enlist, <laughs> enrollment list file that the health, homes, the health plans give us. And we, on a monthly basis, return with additional information. And each of our contracts created a slightly different version of that Excel file. So it has similar data, but slightly different. And I think everybody knows the frustrations of when you have similar but slightly different Excel files that are due every single month. Um, we also were really challenged to submit medical claims since we didn't start this. We are not a medical provider. We're trying to stay in our lane and be really clear that you don't, this is not a clinical service. This is not a clinical setting. We don't hire licensed staff. Our care coordinators are not licensed. They are supervised by licensed folks, but they are not licensed folks. Um, and then successfully connecting with small private physician offices. So Connecting with some of the bigger physicians offices like the federally qualified health centers is fairly straightforward. But when we're talking about a list of 60 different small practices that might be part of IPAs um, and trying to connect with them and explain to them what health homes is and why they want to receive a health action plan for all their patients, especially while they were all stretched beyond thin during COVID, that was very challenging. And then also same situation with connecting with our hospitals um, and emergency departments. Next slide. I think we've been really successful though in a couple key ways that I think others around the state could learn from. I think the partnership between the Neighborhood Networks Hub and the community-based partners that are a part of our network has been very successful. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback from our uh, participating network community-based organizations that this is contracts they would not have otherwise had if it weren't for the hub. So it allowed them to participate in the, in the Medi-Cal program in ways they hadn't been able to participate up to now. Um, it allowed the hub, having the hub focus on outreach and enrollment, I think was really successful in that we dedicated a tremendous amount of resources figuring out how to do outreach and enrollment. It was sort of our laser focus. 
Um, we put a lot of focus into workforce development. So a lot of our social service agencies and community-based organizations, they're already experts in those health-related social needs and the social determinants of health, but they need more training and support and doing the clinical supports, the care coordination, case management, and our focus on continuous quality improvement has been an area of success. Um, and we are looking to uh, continue into the future in 2022 with several, most, I would say all of the ECM target populations, I think our network of providers could serve well. Some of our network of providers are also very interested in adding in lieu of services. So how do we build on the contracts we have today and look to also gain in lieu of service contracts and make it very seamless? And then creating an integrated network of solutions for lasting health improvements by doing all of this. That's what we're looking at for the future. Um, I think as we look at CalAIM, you know, Department of Healthcare Services has come, you know, called out here that plans are, they're asking plans to partner with community-based partners as a priority for CalAIM. And we feel like the Neighborhood Networks Hub really offers a solution to do that um, and gives community-based partners, specifically those that are not already in clinical, will face many of the challenges we faced and they're gonna need this additional support. And we're interested in uh, leveraging and growing the model that we developed here in San Diego. And that's it. We wanna take a minute to find out if there's any questions at this point in the presentation before we head to our final, uh, final uh, uh, time with Cal AIM. Is there any questions uh, that you might use, uh, utilize the uh, chat feature or the Q&A feature as well? All right, then let's go to our next uh, presentation here with Cal AIM. Thank you, Jim. Uh, my name is Sydney Turner. I am the manager of health policy from HealthNet, and it is my privilege and pleasure to talk to you today about my favorite subject, which is Cal AIM, uh, aka California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal. Next slide, please. So what is CalAIM? It is a multi-year initiative by DHCS to improve the quality of life and health outcomes of our members by implementing broad delivery system program and payment reform across the Medi-Cal program. Uh, DHCS has three goals associated with this uh, proposal. Uh, one is identifying and managing member risk and need through whole person care approaches and addressing social determinants of health. Moving Medi-Cal to a more consistent and seamless system by reducing complexity and increasing flexibility. Uh, and finally, improving quality outcomes, reduce health disparities, and drive delivery system transformation and innovation through value-based initiatives, modernization of systems, and payment reform. Um, so what does that mean and, and what is really changing? Um, so on your screen, you should see a quick list of some of the components of CalAIM. Uh, I will fly not all of them. Uh, CalAIM has a variety of components that I fondly call tentacles, and they are on um, different uh, timelines, if you will. So um, up first, and I'm sure you've started to hear about this, is the um, implementation of a new benefit called Enhanced Care Management and in lieu of services, which we'll dig into on the next slide. Um, also happening in 2022 is uh, the carbon of the major organ transplant into managed care. Um, so previously, managed care plans may have covered a couple transplant services, but now we get to cover all of them, um, which is great because we get to assist that member, um, you know, during their transplant experience and post experience and really support them and enable good care coordination and case management. Um, also being carved in and I'm skipping down to long term care. Um, currently, when uh, members who are in managed care go into a long term care facility, we do need to disenroll them to fee for service. Well, come 1-1-2023, we get to keep them um, and support them through their uh, entire long-term care stay or possibly even transition them back to the community um, if it is safe to do so. Um, so the reason why I'm flagging some of these items here for you is um, this is um, the beginning steps of how we get to some benefit standardization, right? Um, so carving in these benefits underneath the managed care plan will allow for um, more seamless uh, delivery and, and enhance that care coordination. Um, of course, as many of you are aware, uh, probably on this call is there's an update uh, to the definition of medical necessity. Um, having that line in the sand between 
mild to moderate and seriously mentally ill a bit more clear. And uh, we know that the counties and DHCS are working through a transition our assessment and transition document now to align on one form statewide, which is exciting. Some other um, key changes coming through the Cal AIM is the dual special need program. Um, and through the dual special need program, which we'll be um, implementing in 2023, um, managed care members will go through an aligned enrollment process. So currently members who are in managed care and have Medicare and Medicaid, they can have two different health plans, um, which would make care coordination and case management a little difficult. Um, so come 1-1-2023 and starting in our CCI counties, uh, an aligned uh, managed care enrollment process will occur. Um, the aligned enrollment process will uh, impact the rest of the state come 2025. So we'll get to watch and uh, lessons learned from our CCI partners and counties here. In 2023, uh, the managed care plans will be required to um, submit a population health management strategy to DHCS. And so um, as the policy develops for the population health management strategy, strategy please think of uh, ECM and in lieu of services as tools in that toolbox. Um, specific population interventions to really help um, address the members' needs and, and social determinants of health. In 2026, um, we will, we, the managed care plans, will be required to be NCQA accredited. And then finally, in 2027, the goal is to have a statewide managed long-term services and supports, which you might know as MLTSS, um, and implementing the in lieu of services will also help support that effort. Next slide, please. So um, here we're digging into what enhanced care management and in lieu of services are. So enhanced care management is a, a whole person approach to care addressing the clinical and non-clinical needs of the member. It is different than maybe your regular old case management, if you will, in the sense that we're moving away from over the phone case management to meeting the member where they're at in the community and, and rendering these services in person uh, to the extent possible. There are a few core service components to enhanced care management. Um, and if you are a health homes program county, you might notice that these six components are familiar and similar from that program. Um, enhanced care management, I'm sorry, health homes program and aspects of whole person care are definitely the precursor for what enhanced care management is going to become. And down below that, um, I provided some examples of who can be an enhanced care management provider. And uh, this, is, this is not a limited list. Uh, we, we have options and there's room to be flexible here. Um, but basically what Calim is offering is a whole bunch of opportunities for us to partner in different ways or more directly um, and then make improvements to how you know, we share information and render services today. We think we know that uh, enhanced care management providers could also possibly be in lieu of service providers. Um, in lieu of services will be voluntary for the managed care plans by county um, and DHCS has provided a list of 14 pre-approved in lieu of service options that you see before you now. Um, the goal, uh, as I stated, was to have all 14 stood up to support that statewide MLTSS by 2027. Um, so currently the managed care plans are partnering with whole person care lead entities um, and health homes providers to understand what services are being offered that take and tie or map to these in lieu of service options. Um, and, and, you know, some of you have probably also been um, received an outreach request from, from either HealthNet or another managed care plan to start some of these discussions to learn more about what you do today to see if any of those programs could possibly um, fit in the in lieu of service box or complement your current service offering. Next slide. The next couple of slides are going to be a little bit about timing. So um, the enhanced care management um, implementation has a couple of different phases. Phase one counties are those that have a whole person care uh, program or a health homes program. Um, there are some deliverables due. So um, as you can see, MOC stands for model of care. That is the deliverable that the managed care plans are responsible for submitting to DHCS. And it has a couple of different parts. So part one, I would think about these as the operational cogs and wheels. You know, how are you gonna stand this program up? How are you partnering and engaging with your county partners and other entities in the community to ensure no duplication of services? 
Uh, part two is more about your declaring your network and your in lieu of service offering and providing uh, contract language. Uh, phase one counties will go live 1-1-2022 one, one, with um, a portion of the target population, um, members who are currently enrolled in whole person care in the health homes programs will be lifted and shifted or grandfathered into enhanced care management automatically. Um, there will be a reassessment of these members to determine the appropriate level of care. Currently, the guidance says six months. Uh, but we're, we're hoping for a little bit more flexibility from DHCS on this one and, and possibly asking for a year. The managed care plan will also be identifying new individuals who meet the homeless high utilizer, seriously mentally ill, emotionally disturbed, or substance use disorder descriptions, target population descriptions for ECM, and assigning those uh, members to the enhanced care management provider for a direct outreach and engagement. Uh, the work's not done there after 1 1 2022. If you're in a phase two county, we are working through our submissions, and then July comes comes in 2022 and additional uh, members are added to the target population that can be serviced. So children or youth at risk of institutionalization, the nursing facility residents, and then um, all of the target populations go live for our phase two counties. Just when you thought the fun was over, uh, we need to work on a, a re-entry population model of care. So one of the, the final target populations that will be phased in in 1-1-2023 is the re-entry population. And, we are really looking forward to um, intervening early and more directly with these individuals and learning more about all of the good work that you guys do out here and how we can complement and partner. Next slide. Just a little bit more about timing um, and giving you a look uh, on your right here about who is in phase one and phase two. Um, there is your a more summarized version of the of the deliverables due around enhanced care management and in lieu of services specifically. It does not include the reentry portion, um, and then also flagging that there is some additional guidance coming from DHCS. Um, so in late April, we are anticipating an initial round of frequently asked questions, which uh, the department said they will be updating regularly as um, more questions roll in and we learn more. <clears throat> And then in May, um, we are going to have our final documents, if you will, or guidance for the enhanced care management and in lieu of services. Um, so the final version of the DHC, DHCS to manage care contract, manage care to provider contract, the model of care requirements, and then the um, HICPIC coding guidance. Also in May, we will receive um, draft enhanced care management rates. Um, and we're hearing that they're going to be provided, um, you know, specific by county and managed care plan. And then finally, some more information about the incentive payment design document. We have a little bit now, um, which I'll show you in the next or in a couple slides um, and and hoping to learn more and looking forward to the opportunities to further partner and, and do some cool stuff um, with the available funds. And then finally, in July, um, DHCS will provide in lieu of service pricing guidance um, to help the managed care plans, you know, through those contract negotiations for those 14 in lieu of services. Next slide. Okay, um, the performance incentive. So currently there are $600 million uh, available in our general fund to draw down for incentive um, payments. And these are available through 2022 to 2024. Um, so the ask is, is that the managed care plans partner with um, the counties or community-based organizations in the community to draft um, proposals that will, <clears throat> um, you know, build sustainable ECM and in lieu of service capacity, drive um, investment in the ne necessary delivery system infrastructure, um, incentivize more of those in lieu of services to be added, uh, bridge any current silos across physical and behavioral health care delivery, uh, improve quality and performance, and then also, of course, reduce health disparities and promote health equity. Uh, below all that, you can see a little bit about the timeline. <clears throat> so there is some more information to come from DHCS on this. Um, they've shared what their thinking is and, and, and how they are thinking about the incentive and how it applies to ECM and in lieu of services. Next slide. So finally, um, I hustled through some of those Cal AIM slides, but I wanted to spend some time and, and welcome my other panelists, uh, friends here to take themselves off mute to chime in. Um, 
you know, CalAIM and DHCS is really encouraging the managed care plans to partner closely with you, the counties, and in some, some scenarios, the cities, and especially community-based organization and providers um, to really develop the model of care for enhanced care management and in lieu of services, identify where there are in infrastructure and capacity building needs or opportunities, um, but really making sure that the good work that, that we did through whole person care and health homes, and I say we uh, as California as a state, um, to make sure that, that those, those lessons learned and those good programs and models are sustained uh, underneath the managed care plans through enhanced care management and in lieu of services. Um, so in San Diego, there are a few of us. It is a GMC county. Um, we do have a Healthy San Diego work group that's currently made up of 168 entities where we're, we're working through this. Um, HealthNet has the privilege in being uh, in a few different counties. So um, bringing in experience about what's working um, in terms of transition discussions uh, across the state. And so below underneath transition topics are just some ideas about things that uh, you can tackle or leverage to get those conversations started, um, or at least uh, for sure want to accomplish, you know, as we think through the model of care. So I know we only have two minutes left. Um, Dr. Tudor or George or Amherst is, or Kitty, is there anything else you would like to add? This, this is George. I just wanted to, hopefully don't mind if I clarify something, Sydney, and sure. super nice job. And I know, man, did we cover a lot of stuff. So San Diego's um, a little bit different than some counties. And a couple of things, um, just to make sure everybody knows, on, on transplants, um, carving that into the health plans is a, is a good thing because it's better coordinated, as Sydney said. Um, just want to make sure everybody knows that it's not that our Medi-Cal beneficiaries don't get transplants right now, but what happens if somebody, for instance, needed a heart transplant, the state of California would disenroll them from our plan, and then they would pay for the transplant. And then after they're medically clear, six to 12 months later, they put them back on the health plan. So they still have that benefit. I didn't want it to sound like they don't get transplants other than the two that we do cover. And then the other thing for San Diego County, when it comes to long-term custodial care that's part of this whole CalAIM umbrella, there's a lot of counties which are called CCI, Coordinated Care Initiative counties, who have already been covering long-term custodial care, um, which, is, which is identified as skilled nursing facility for more than 60 days. So San Diego County has been covering this since um, 2014. But other than that, perfect. George. Just really want to emphasize that, um, you know, as the managed care plans get together with you, um, the county stakeholders here, we really are after collaborating and not competing here and trying trying to do what's right. Um, really excited about the enhanced care management in lieu of service opportunity and all of the wonderful benefits that it's going to bring um, to our members and, and the most vulnerable of our Medi-Cal populations. Great, and it looks like Kitty that, that you answered uh, this last question here. Fantastic. Uh, any other questions uh, today, or anything uh, that our panel might want to add here at the last minute? Looks like there's a question uh, pertaining to the in lieu of services. So, just want to clarify: they are instead of something more expensive, they're not replacing. Uh, none of the current state health plan services are going to be replaced by ECM and in lieu of services. These are intended to be an additional and really complement what is currently being offered out there. Uh, so the in lieu of services uh, are instead of ER inpatient or skilled nursing facility, for instance. Excellent. We have another question. Are there any specific technology infrastructure that will be needed for ECM? Oh, boy. I think that's, I, I, this is Jen, I think that's a great question because um, as we're going from like whole person care where that IT system or platform was sponsored by the county and worked in conjunction with the HIE, now as we move with Health Homes program and then to Cal AIM, we're looking at a system that everyone can partner in. Um, and so there are some of the CIEs. Um, and I know that um, Kitty, one of the things that you did is look at where those gaps are. And even if we have platforms or systems um, that can share some basic information, like when you went to the emergency department or something like that, you still need a system for the CBCME 
um, to record the actual interactions. Um, and so just setting that up because one of the goals of CalAIM is really for now with these funds going to the health plans to help support and continue that integration of, of IT platforms, it's really difficult. Um, it's a real challenge. Um, and especially if you have multiple plans as patients are moving from plan to plan or from um, PCP to PCP, keeping that CBCME central to, um, to the patient and the family is really important. So I'll stop there, but that's just kind of an overview of some of the challenges we're looking at with CalAIMS and how can we make those great goals actually work. Thank right. you, Dr. Tudor. And, and the, the infrastructure looks different by county, right? Uh, you all are unique and different. So um, thinking about ways to enable and support you is, is part of those discussions as well and possible uh, performance incentive opportunities. Fantastic. I uh, want to just let you know that if you have any follow-up questions, uh, once you receive the uh, slide deck and the recording later today, feel, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the panelists, and we will make sure that your questions get answered. Again, Sydney, thank you for your leadership today, and, and panel, thank you so much for your expertise and the work that you're doing to make a difference in the lives of so many Californians. Uh, through this program, uh, through Cal AIM. Thank you so much for your day and, and to uh, our attendees that came. Thank you so much for attending and uh, look for that recording and, uh, and that slide deck. And again, just really celebrate uh, the partnership between HealthNet and CSAC and the CSAC Finance Corporation. Thanks again for your attendance today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Favorite subject. Thank you all. Stay safe. Exactly.